with the Drive for Five. It is our All-Ireland special. We've been building up to Sunday's final between Dublin and Kerry. We have had a stellar lineup in the last hour alone. We've had Paul Herty, Amy McGee, Aaron Kernan, David Brady, Charlie Redmond, Ross Munley. That in the last hour alone. We're into hour 12 right now of this and we're here all the way through until midnight. Coming up at half past seven through till ten, we're going to bring you last night's Roadshow from St. Vincent's in North Dublin. It was a brilliant night up there. The great Mickey Whelan was along for the evening. He joined us on stage. We'll hear from him. Eamon Fennell, Mossy Quinn, with a few outsiders as well. Pillar Caffrey and Denise Masterson joined us. And also Andy Moran, who of course retired this week, joined us on stage. So that coming away from half past seven. John Giles is going to be with us as well. He's going to come into studio just after nine o'clock to address some of the stories of this week. So that's to come just after nine o'clock. But for the next half an hour, we're going to be joined by some real GEA royalty. The great Mihola Murherty is in studio. How are you? Very good indeed. I think you missed one all day. It was a great day to bring in a fortune teller. Oh really? Yeah? Well, maybe have, that's your job. They might have some idea how it will go on Sunday. Have you any idea how it's going to go on Not Sunday? Not really. I'd like to see the teams. I, I know the teams that will be announced mm. won't be the teams that will go behind the Artem band around Crow Park. When did so. that change? What was I'd when when you were covering all Ireland managers finals? Managers got more powerful. Mm. It's from the managers that came. I remember a time now when a Kerry team would be announced on the Wednesday night, sometimes the Tuesday night. Uh, if it would be in Tralee, it would be in the steps of the hotel, and the county secretary would come out and he'd read it, and there'd be a big crowd. Wow, big crowd. And then if it would be in Killarney, it would be the same ritual different person and I think people liked to have the team early early in the week they could be discussing it oh, I think publicity is lost by not having a team until the end of the week absolutely and then the team that's announced doesn't correspond with the team that takes the field but then that's the way the world has been changing since day one so would word go out that the team was going to be announced in Tralee or Killarney at 7 o'clock and granted that would be Either the Tuesday night or the Wednesday night. And would it be supporters, journalists, oh, supporters, everybody? Or journalists would be there, but journalists didn't travel that much at that time, but would be sent to them there and then. Uh, followers, you know, and people mm. that would be interested, because there'd be a lot of debates before a team was picked, because in those days, a thing called the comeback. Somebody retired a year earlier, maybe kept playing football, with the club. The call had come through. And then the call would come through, we need you. And he mightn't have done any serious training for the 12 months. I remember now, 1949, when Meat won their All Ireland for the first time ever. Car Jim Carney was playing at midfield. He had retired 12 months before that. He was played at midfield and he was the man of the match. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I'd imagine then, like, it was such. A good talking point for the next three or four days for to have the team, as you said, to have a proper uh, have discussion team, about yeah, yeah. what might happen and be able what to go might. back through previous games. And, uh, has uh, that been lost a bit? Do you think the build up is I very different it, now? It is different. I remember now um, Connacht replay, Galway and Mayo. Mayo won. And I met Father Leo Moore, and he was a great follower of football. He was chairman of the Mayo County Board in his time and all that. I met him after the, the replay. And we spoke for about an hour and I said to him, now I'm heading off to Dublin, getting late. And he said something that stayed with me ever since. Isn't it an awful pity we have only one week to be looking forward to it? Mm. And there is a lot in that. The looking forward, you know, and uh, that's added to if people knew the team. And that's been lost as well for that a lot of the lost, summer now yes. because it's such a condensed people summer. People now the people mm. that weren't named that will be played. <laughs> Yeah, we spent half the summer talking about Jeremy Connolly. Connolly, he will appear. Yeah. Definitely. When needed. When needed, it might not surprise me if, if he started. He has been a very good player. I remember one time now, the night he scored eight points under the lights in Croke Park against a packed ground playing Tiro. I was down doing a celebrity banished door match down in, in the West, West Galway. Mm. And I told him, now, I'm leaving the moment the match is over. I want to be in Croke Park for every kick of the game. <laughs> Work Grand ran into a petrol station to get a drop of tea for the road back. So I was coming out the door, who was coming in on crutches, but Leicester 
Ryan Kilkenny, Kilkenny Hurler. Former Hurler, his son won an All Ireland later. He was on crutches and I was in the hurling. I said, Lester, you want to start talking about hurling now? <laughs> I'm going to Croke Park. I don't want to miss any bit of it. He said, keep an eye on young Connolly. And that's the night he scored the seven points from play against Tyrone. He is a very good player. What shape he's in now, he hasn't played serious, high-level football now for quite a while. Mm. But he's, uh, and he's a great hurdler. You know, his, his father hurdled with Clara down in Kilkenny and was a very good player. So that's where it comes from. It's very much in the blood. Oh, very much. Because we're going to hear a lot more about Jeremy Connolly. We, had, we were in Vincent's last night and Mickey Whelan, was, who's now Mickey. coaching the hurlers, was raving about Jeremy Connolly as a hurler and maybe that's and where his Mickey future lies. Mickey has put his life to it. He was He's an incredible with, man, isn't he? He was playing with Clonagale for a good number mm. of years. And then he went to America to study. And he brought new ideas home with him and he became a coach. The word manager hadn't yet come and he was he's given his life to it. Clonagale used to be his club. He went with Vincent's, gave them great service and he was a great character to meet and he was an extremely stylish football. He played centre forward and as the old timers you say about centre forward, place a good man at centre forward and build the team around him. Mickey was that sort. What was your All Ireland final routine when you were commentating when you were working how yeah. did you did you have a were you superstitious was it the same weekend uh, no, every year no superstition yeah i always liked to be in croke park early on how early is early i was there at eight o'clock at times there used to be a mass i'm sure it's still there at that time and but the staff people would be coming and there'd be a huge staff coming in you know hundreds of them coming in early in the morning mm. the head down hoping that whatever they're whatever part they have in it, that that would go well, and the great people. I'd be down there, and you'd meet people, and you'd learn a few things, and I used to like always to see the teams arriving, getting off a bus, maybe, underneath the stand. You could read bits into that. You could, in the dressing room, I always went to dressing rooms. You were not allowed, the manager don't allow anyone near no. the dressing room. You still room. get in, though. Well, I have got in. <laughs> I remember one time, Jad Lucknine, who was a wonderful character. Uh, Claire would not have won anything without Jad being mm. manager. He was a strong, hard man, hard on players. But uh, I remember now, 95 was the year. They lost, as somebody said, as usual to Kilkenny in the league final. But uh, in the interview that he gave after the game, he just dismissed the league. We will win the Munster Championship. Nobody believed me. He said to me, after, you don't believe me, but we will win it. They hadn't won since 1932, and that was o their only one since 1914, a year they won the all Ireland. So, and he was there, they won it. The day of the Munster final, Limerick were the team that were extremely unlucky the year before. 1995, five points up against Offaly. The game over, they were mm. dominant right through, and then one after another. Two goals and five points in four minutes and 52 seconds. I had two stopwatches for some <laughs> reason that day. And Con Hulhan put it very well. Now I just like meeting Con and knowing Con and reading what he wrote. What he wrote about it, for 65 minutes we were all in glee behind the, the, the canal goal. There was no stand behind at that time. That's where the Limerick followers were. And Con always went among the people. Never went into a press box, even though he was a journalist. And he said, "'Twas glee for 65 minutes. And almost suddenly, a silence depend, <laughs> descended upon, to, you know, the two mm. goals. And then he said, "'I walked in silence with them, up to the road. The awfully followers were coming from the other side down, they too were silent, he said. And then he finished it by saying, that was the first time I really understood what dumbfounded means, <laughs> when nobody could say I believe it. But then they had played great football, they played great football to the Munster final, playing Clare, rank outsiders. I was inside in the Clare dressing room before they came in. Uh, I used to like to see them coming, or maybe off a bus or something. And Ger was fussed in and with his jaunty step he came straight up to me 
And he said, no, Robert Fuckle, don't say a word, but just look at them. And I did look at them one after another, and I saw something in them that I had never seen in Claire Hodlins before. And it didn't surprise me. What was it? Uh, you know, that they won it. Mm. There was something about it. the steeliness. They were, they were very confident looking. They seemed to be very focused. They all came in, they placed their bag there, took off the jacket. They used to arrive in jackets that had hang it up and a good sign when you see, when you hear silence, if that makes sense. But they won it well and he also told me, by the way, he said there'll be a number 28. We have a number 28, but his name won't be on the programme or anything. And he gave me his name and so on. He's the guy that came up, scored the goal, was taken off immediately. <laughs> Jared didn't know who scored the goal. He was at sideline level, lot of people around the goal. I think managers should be high up where you're looking mm. down and you can see everyone. So he was taken off. To this day, he doesn't know, <laughs> understand, but he had scored the goal, which was great to see them winning after so long. And Claire Hodling has been in the news ever since, really. That's for sure. Which is great. I want to bring in another Kerry man. Another Kerry man. <laughs> Gary Breen, the former Republic of Ireland oh, international. Yeah, uh, international, yes. <laughs> uh, very much a, a proud Kerry man on weekends like this, Gary. I've sat beside you at Premier League matches when Mayo have played Kerry and uh, you've generally had the upper hand and you've enjoyed it immensely. Uh, Michal Amar Hurtig is in studio with us. Tell us your Kerry roots. Well, my dad's from Kerry, from Glencar, and in the family he's now hailing out of both. But my mum's from Clare, so I always adopted the fact that Kerry was my football team, Clare was my hurling team. But it's a pleasure now to listen to me all there talking because I remember listening to all those commentaries and it's just great reminiscing. You guys asked me to talk about what it meant to me as a kid growing up um, supporting that great Kerry team of the 80s. And I was literally transfixed by them. I really was. As a young player then, you think about that great team in terms of from 78 through to 86 and obviously going for that five in a row, what it meant to my dad, the heartbreak he had listened to the game when Offaly got that last minute goal to deny that. And just reminiscing now and thinking back, not just because of that great Terry team, but mm. what it meant to me, I was so emotionally invested in them because of the fact that I had wonderful childhood memories of being in Kerry as a kid on my summer holidays, my dad taking me to games, but not would be my uncle Eamon doing it the majority of the time. So my dad be working still in London, would come and join us for two weeks of the summers. But it's just a wonderful time. And um, and at times, as the years go by, you kind of forget about them. And then obviously you guys asked me to reminisce going into this iconic game this weekend, what it meant to me. And it, it just, it, it literally brought back some wonderful memories. There's an All-Ireland medal in your family? There is. I initially thought that there was two, but it was... My great-grandfather, Paddy Breen, who would have played in the 1913 um, Coke, Coke Park remote Memorial game, but then got the all Ireland medal in 1914. He obviously played for Tottenham as well during that time. But there's a bigger link in terms of why I, I'm so invested into Kerry. Of course, my, my, my family and, and my great-grandfather winning that medal. But his brother-in-law was Dr. Eamon O'Sullivan. You think of an iconic, you know, we're talking about iconic mm. Kerry men here in terms of the fact that he won all Ireland titles over five decades i mean it's unprecedented it's incredible to look back on it and that was something that as a youngster who was desperate to know about kerry football i was so invested in so proud of and i just look back with with, with great memories paddy breen was before your time but did you he was hear indeed, stories? The, the name lives on and there was a breen connected in somewhere with the first uh, in the first all ireland that won in the in, after the 1900s coming now interesting now that he's a, a rugby man the first Kerry team that appeared in an All-Ireland final, they were actually rugby players. Kerry was overrun with rugby teams in the early days of the GA. Oh, really? Yet there yeah. was a rugby club, even in Valencia Island, every town in Kerry. And then the GA was founded and Gaelic football was a game that was invented at that time. And three young teachers arrived down in Kilargolan. Kilargolan at that time, and it was Dr. Raymond's father was the rugby captain of the winning team in, Mont in Kerry that time, J.P. O'Sullivan. Right. Yeah. And they were approached by the two young lads who had seen and played the new footballist, was called in Dublin. And he convinced them in a pub in Kilarglen that they should change their name from being 
uh, uh, RFC or whatever they are, to Lone Rangers. And they all turned over, playing the new game, reached the All Ireland final, beaten by Dublin in 1892. And in no time at all, all the rugby clubs died in Kerry, and there was a Gaelic club everywhere. Mm. Only for that happening, maybe there'd be 10 players now from Kerry off to Japan shortly. <laughs> <laughs> Gary. It, it's strange, these things happen, and part of history and part of the, the folklore. Gary, you obviously grew up very much in the Irish community over in London. Did you play much Gaelic football? Now, listen, I would have played a lot when I came over and, and my summer holidays. And I always remember where, where my family is now in Beaufort. There's a beautiful pitch there and I'd walk up to there and be kicking for the goals myself or the points and loving it. And, you know, you try and obviously my dad at the time, you'll know, Nathan, there's a there's a big um, um, Gaelic football community around Rice Lips. And my dad would take me for games there. And as young boys, you'd be kicking the ball and stuff like that. But I never got to play in an actual game. And I would have loved to have done uh, because obviously I idolised that great team of, mm. of the of the nineteen eighties, and I, I, yeah. I remember the names so vividly now: Jack O'Shea, Ambrose O'Donovan, these type of goals. And I was in so much in awe of Bomber Liston because I was looking at him as a young lad, and he just looked like a giant of a man. Yeah. He really did the way he'd be pulling them balls out of the air, holding that ball up, and then the Spillane brothers, Ogie Moore, and you know John Egan, these type of guys. I mean, they were literally my heroes. And it's incredible that yeah. they were so successful for that period. And yet, going up into then 1986, where they won their last title, they didn't even get to a final for another year, 11 years. And that probably coincides with where my passion then really transferred towards the, the, the Irish football team in terms of 88 and terms mm. like that. But nevertheless, I look back on that golden era and it really was that. It, it, it was just that and such special times to be out be brought to those games, watch those games, and with my uncle more than anything. And I even remember being in Clare with my uncle, other uncles, watching a game where Kerry were playing Monaghan in the semi final, and it looked like they were going to be beaten. I think Kerry got a last score just to get a replay. And my two uncles in Clare were really teasing me, and I jumped up so high. And it was at the aim, and my uncle took me to the replay where they comfortably beat Monaghan then. And, and I think they went, went on to beat the Dubs by four points in the final. So I still have wonderful memories of that. I really do. Well, Gary, you're going to be at the North London Derby working for us yeah. on Sunday <laughs> alongside a true blue dub in Stephen I know. Doyle. He's, al he's already told me he's devastated that he's with me that day. <laughs> and to be yeah. fair, I think I've been caught out by the fact that, in my mind, the, the All Island final is always the third week in September. I know, and I know. I've been pushed forward for certain things. And I just got caught out by obviously giving my name for obviously accepting the game Arsenal Tottenham and, and listen that's going to be a great game of course it was and I've got spots from fond memories of an Arsenal supporter growing up but if there's one place to be it's Croke Park Gary great stuff thanks for taking the call we talked to you on Sunday pleasure thanks yeah. guys best of luck to you Gary and you'll be over for the celebrations I uh, hope no doubt I will be there's no doubt about it and Neil <laughs> it's a pleasure to actually speak to you I hope to meet you one day I hope so Neil we're, we're short on time We'd, we could talk to you all night yeah. obviously this weekend, like, do you still get the same excitement when you walk down towards Crow Park? Will you go down? Well, will you go down as early? I do really. No, I retired from broadcasting mm. games in 2010, but uh, it's a different type of retire. If you're in a, in a job, civil service or something, you walk out you the door leave, and leave it behind. And you don't meet the, mm. your friends for 12 months, Christmas dinner or something. But I go to all the games, so there has been no change really. And I was always looking forward to the game. And the most hyped up game that I remember was the 1955 final between Kerry and Dublin. Oh, yeah? That was fantastic. Mm. Dublin, you know, had won, they, they won before, they were built up. Uh, not enough credit. You say you wouldn't Vincent's. Vincent's made the modern Dublin. When they won, when Dublin won in 1942, there were two men from Dingle, midfield. There was a man from Kilargan centre forward. There was another one in the backs. Caleb Cronhorn and Al Island with Cork was playing for Dublin. But from when once Vincent arrived, it was Dublin players for Dublin teams. They've been rising ever since. Well, it's some lineage when you go from oh, yes. Hefo to Tony Hanahoe, Jimmy Keaveney, through to the modern age, uh, from Mickey Whelan then to Pat Gilroy to Jeremy Connolly. And to show how good they were, in 1953, they beat the reigning all Ireland champions captain in the league final with 14 Vincent's players and the, the goalkeeper from Airco. 
completely. And they did the same in 55, winning the league again. And when they played in the All Ireland in 55, there were at least 12 Dublin Vincent's players on the team. Right. There should be a monument somewhere in Dublin and a huge one to Kevin Heffernan, the driving force between all, be, all of that. I feel like you're above predictions. Well, or do you want to make one for Sunday? Uh, well, I've said, if you, if you look at the, the teams in print, the Dublin team, you know, it's like a masterpiece, you know, the name, the very names mm. of panel, subs and everything. They look unbeatable, but any team is beatable. It's a young Kerry team. Young teams often cost surprises. They'll be trying to do that. I hope it's a game that will be remembered for whatever reason. Dublin have an advantage. You know, they're a wonderful set. They go out to play football. They have a plan. They stick to the plan. The plan works. Maybe they'll come. That it won't work. The great thing, as Father Leo said, to be looking forward. Mm. That's great. We certainly are. And I'm looking forward. It's been an honour to have you in studio, as always. The first thing everyone says when they meet you is, you're looking in incredible shape for oh. <laughs> 89 years of age. Continued good health and enjoy Sunday as much as you've enjoyed Indeed. all the previous finals. Hope everybody enjoys it. That's us done for now, but we're going to take a quick break because we are going to bring you uh, that show from St. Vincent's last night. We're going to bring you some of the highlights from the show over the next hour and a half or so. We'll have some Dublin nostalgia for you before the glory years with Pillar Caffrey, Eamon Fennell and Mossy Quinn. And of course it wouldn't be complete without a Mayo man butting in there. We'll hear from Andy Moore as well. That's next. Off the Ball on News Talk.